Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the webinar, How to Bring Safer Blood Bags to Healthcare. My name is Grazia Ciocci and I'm Deputy Director of Healthcare Without Harm Europe. This webinar is hosted by Healthcare Without Harm Europe, a coalition of hospitals, health systems, local authorities, and environmental and health organizations working together to make the healthcare sector more environmentally and socially sustainable. The webinar is organized by the Egrelius Institute in Sweden under the framework of the PVC Free Blood Bag Project, an EU Life Plus program funded project aiming at producing blood bags that do not contain PVC. This is an important project as currently for all other medical equipment, we already have a PVC free medical devices on the market. Today, we will hear why it is important to bring safer blood bags to healthcare and how it is possible to produce and procure them with both industry and healthcare facility, talking about their challenges and how they have overcome them. I would like to welcome you all here today and thank you for joining us. We have a wide range of participants from different countries, including Iceland, Belgium, and the United States, Norway, Argentina, France, Mexico, and the Philippines among others. Before introducing the speakers, I would like to remind the participants that they have automatically been muted upon entry to the webinar and will be able to ask questions through the chat box, which is on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. To do this, please send your message via private chat to Katarina Rickenberg, whose name you will see in the presenter's list. We will then select one question to ask after each presentation, and the remaining questions will be asked at the end of the webinar, if time allows. I would also like to remind participants that they will receive an email over the coming week with a link to download the presentations from today and a link to be able to watch the webinar back and share among colleagues. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please send a message through the private chat function to Help Without Harm Europe, where our assistant will be on hand to help you. I'm very happy to welcome and introduce our very high-level speakers today. Gustav Eriksson, Head of Environment at Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm, Sweden, who will tell us about the latest project results of the PVC Free Blood Bag project. Yes, uh, Laura Arsen, uh, business director and co-owner of Meritech, who will share with us the industry perspective, and Lena C, project manager at the Yegrelius Institute for Applied Green Chemistry. I now give the floor to Mr. Gustav Eriksson from Karolinska University Hospital to begin. Thank you very much. Uh, it's of course very nice to speak in this seminar. Uh, I'm going to talk about why we want a PVC-free blood bag. But first, I'm going to talk a little about uh, a bit about our hospital and what we are doing in general. Karolinska is a public hospital governed by Stockholm County Council in Sweden. It's uh, one of the largest university hospitals in Europe with approximately 1,700 beds on two different sites, one north of Stockholm and one south of Stockholm. Besides healthcare, our mission as a university hospital also includes education and research. Uh, so that's the picture. And uh, we are about 15,000 employees, broken down to these different fields of competence, with a total sales of about 16 billion Swedish crowns. The hospital is divided into seven clinical divisions based on different medical areas. Uh, for the project, the most important part of our organization is the clinic of transfusion medicine belonging to the Karolinska University Hospital. The laboratory has about 2,000 employees conducting 20 million different tests per year. The laboratory are also responsible for Stockholm County Council blood donors program, using approximately 80,000 blood bags per year to a cost of 10 million Swedish crowns, or 1 million euros. Uh, 
Karinska works actively with environmental issues. We have a dedicated and environmentally conscious organization, and we have been certified according to the environmental standard ISO 14001 for 10 years, since 2005. We strive to be a role model, constantly improving our operation towards sustainability by working with health promotion, resource efficiency, and of course reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Karolinska is one of the world's most environmentally adapted hospital uh, because we have the broadest environmental work addressing all the environmental aspects of the healthcare sector that we have the power to influence. This is what makes us stand out in all the good work that's actually been done all over the world. But we have some challenges. In our hospital today, we consume a huge number of plastic disposal products. To decrease the impact of these plastics on both health and the environment, we've been working to face out the harmful substances within plastics since the 1990s. In 1997, Stockholm County made a decision not to use PVC. We started out with phasing out our ex examination gloves made of PVC containing the phthalate DEHP uh, to gloves with other types of softeners, less hazardous. Today, approximately 97% of the gloves are not even PVC, but nitride, with no hazardous softness at all. This means that Karolinska alone has reduced the amount of DEHP for examination gloves with 40 tons per year. When we started with facing out PVC, we had a clear strategy. We wanted to start with products that exposed patients or staff to chemical the most, such as tubings, gloves, and of course blood bags. The first aim is to try to change plastic from PVC to a less hazardous plastic, like, for example, polyolefins. If that's not possible, we want to change the plasticizer to one that's not so dangerous as the phthalate DHP. We know that it's our younger patient, youngest patients that are the most vulnerable. When our children are all exposed, they actually stand the largest risk for measurable effects. So what's the problem? The World Health Organization are warning for the exposure to different endocrine-disrupting chemicals used in society today. There are indications that the everyday exposure to this cocktail of chemicals has effects on, on for example, sperm quality and behavioral disorders. So what if we, as a hospital, contribute to, a direct, to direct exposure with even higher doses than everyday exposure? say from the hormone disrupting chemical DHP. We do not find this coherent with a first do no harm. DHP are classified as a reproductive toxic and there are more and more evidence of the dangers. And this means that it may impair fertility and may cause uh, may cause harm to the unborn child. Together with phthalates like DBP and BBP and DHP, uh, DHP, they are forbidden in toys and childcare products because of the classification as, a tox as toxic to reproduction. The risk with the DHP are emphasized in the directive for medical devices because of the characterization and risk for exposure. In a study, parental, in a study parental nutrition with tubings containing PVC and DHP for patients in the neonate intensive care unit shows high exposure as 2,500 micrograms per kilogram body weight and day 
which is extraordinary when comparing with the normal daily export exposure of three to say 30 micrograms per kilogram by the weight and day. Today, the blood bags for red blood cells are all made of PVC and contain 30 to 40 percent of the plasticizer DHP. The plasticizer in, in the PVC can transfer from the bag into the blood. This means that patients are being exposed. Only in Stockholm County, we are using 80,000 blood bags per year, and this means that just our demand of blood bags needs at least 6.4 tons DHP for production. Another factor to why we don't want PVC is the concept of chlorine. In Sweden, in Sweden, all plastics that cannot be reused for different reasons are sent to incineration plants. And modern plants, are of course, have, uh, have of, of course scrubbers and all kinds of cleaning equipment to prevent toxic emissions, like, for example, dioxin. Dioxin, that is a notorious pollutant for doing combustion of chlorine containing plastics. But our interest in the PVC free blood bags is not just for the Swedish or European market. The market is global, and incineration plant is not as clean everywhere in the world today. So, we are demanding a totally free PVC bag. Uh, PVC free bag, a bag that doesn't need a plasticizer at all. In the future, there might be alternative plasticizers on the market, but we can't predict the consequences of those either. This is why we're taking precautions already now, demanding a PVC free blood bag to avoid known and future risks of plasticizer as far as possible. And of course, no other substances that are harmful to health should be added either. We're also demanding a PVC-free blood bag to avoid emission of dioxin from uncontrolled burning around the world. We think that if we work together on this, it's possible to take, let's take, on, take on the technology, technology, technical and medical challenges to make PVC-free blood bags. We at the public hospital promise that we will use green public procurement to phase out PVC-free uh, blood bags from our operations as soon as there are a realistic alternative. Thank you very much for this opportunity to express our opinion on the matter. And now I should put... Um, thank you so much, Gustav, for an excellent presentation and for all your work. Uh, I have a question for you. As a procurer, what about if uh, the new blood bags, uh, the new PVC blood bags, um, they cost, what about if they cost too much? And um, they, if the cost is too high, uh, would you still procure them for your hospital? Did, uh, I'm not asking, did you ask me if, if the costs today are too high to get the PVC free blood bags? Uh, yes. Yes. Are you okay? Um, yes. Would you and, and we have a limit where how much money we can spend on this problem? But we need to use the the public procurement strat uh, strategy. And of course, the the, uh, the the realistic alternative should have a price that's affordable. Of course, we can say something about it, but that should be uh, to uh, say too much. We can't say how much we're willing to pay for PVC free blood bags. But it need to be uh, need to be uh, realistic. Thank you so much, Gustav. Um, there are no other questions for Gustav so far. Please uh, send your questions during the presentation because otherwise we will not have time to ask them to the presenters. Um, I now give the floor to Mr. Jesper Lawarsen, he's business director and co-owner of Manitech. And um, please, uh, Jesper, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, and thank you for joining this session. Uh, this has been a very interesting project for us to participate in. Uh, and I'm here talking on our behalf as, as part of the supply chain to a potential PVC free blood bag. Just a short outline for my presentation. I will give you a short introduction to our com uh, company. I will tell you a little bit what we do uh, and, and what opportunities that brings. I will also share with you some of the experience that we have had over the last 25 years uh, re with offering PVC replacements. Uh, then I will go in to talk to some of the merits and the benefits that our material will offer. And lastly, I will give you a short uh, feedback on some of the very uh, early trials we had earlier this year on the first prototypes produced. Melotech is a privately owned Danish company. We were founded in Sweden uh, 38 years ago, uh, and we have been focused and uh, dedicated to pharmaceutical packaging and process technologies since our founding. We supply polymers and compounds initially as a trading company by a large American manufacturer, uh, and we were successfully together with this company to to get products established in a market that offered PVC free uh, and replacements to PVC. In the late 90s, the American company wanted to discontinue the manufacturing as the company was splitting up into several uh, uh, several companies. Uh, and we got the opportunity to transfer the technology to Europe, where actually the, the demand was the strongest. We have grown since then into building a new plant in 03, 08 was it extended, and in 14, late, re, most recently, it was further extended. Uh, so now we are reaching an annual capacity of 25,000 tons. We are... Uh, selling our products under the brand name called Meliflex. It is a new standard of compounds and that is 100% dedicated to healthcare. And at our plant, we only produce materials used in healthcare applications. We sell globally today. We have realized that there is a global demand and interest in PVC-free uh, solutions. So today we have a good sales, obviously in Europe, but also strong sales overseas in Asia, in US as well, it's coming along. Uh, since our company is 100% dedicated to, to the healthcare sector, all our attention on innovation, quality and service goes to this sector, which makes us a little bit unique because most material companies out there uh, in, in the world, healthcare is only a small part of their business it can be as low as a few percent only, which means, of course, that their focus and dedication to healthcare is limited to bringing forward new technologies, etc. This is a showing a picture of our plant at the most recent. It is located 100 kilometers south of Denmark, or so south of Copenhagen, apologize. Uh, and we are growing the plant, and we have had a healthy growth. Uh, about 20 to 30 percent per year and I think that it on itself demonstrates that there is a need for PVC free materials. As I mentioned our capacity is 25,000 tons. To most people that doesn't say so much uh, but if I transfer that into IV bags that would equal 2 billion IV bags or if we transfer that into infusion sets that will be equal 25 billion uh, infusion sets. At Gusta mentioned at the Karolinska, you use about 80,000, apologize, there's a zero too much in that number, 80,000 blood bags. And if we look at the one of the bags, that will be about one ton, equal one ton of our material. If we should supply the entire system, then that would equal approximately four to five tons material. So obviously, uh, we have the capacity to, to supply this beyond uh, what is looking for in Karolinska Fruitus in, in Sweden. What we produce is a, the raw material. That's where it all starts. Uh, and basically that comes into the people that are extruding and making products as a pellet. But prior to that, we are designing that pellet when you, with new uh, physical uh, properties making it suitable for, for the intended use. 
We do that by a, a technology called compounding. Basically, we buy and bring in different types of standard polymers used in medical industry and modify these with additives and melt these in, in a, into a homogeneous mixture. That is done during a melt blending and that is referred to as compounding. By the way, a flexible soft PVC is also produced by compounding where you mix uh, plasticizers with PVC powder, stabilizers and such. So overall, we are coming from the same background. However, the setup of, for the facilities making these two types of products are quite different. We cannot, we will and are not running any PVC products in our plants and our products would not be suitable to produce inside a PVC manufacturing plant. The unique thing with Compound is that basically we can combine and bring together the unique properties of various different polymers, getting the best of, of both worlds and create a hybrid material that can give some unique uh, uh, properties suitable for, for, for the use of, or the final use of the product. Another thing that's good and it's important serving the, this market is of course that it's scalable and there's no critical mass. Because in the industry, and this is one of the industry's dilemma, is that healthcare market is trying to drive material suppliers in a certain direction. But since they are consisting of such a small volume take and consumption, they are not really able to, to dictate the trends. These are driven by the automotive and large uh, packaging uh, applications and hygiene and so, and so forth. So, this gives us a unique opportunity to service uh, uh, this market, which is a niche market seen from a plastic converter and producer's perspective. And here we don't have any critical mass. So should Gustav Hospital be the only hospital in the world to wanting PVC free bags? Well, we could still do that. Obviously, we have ambitions as Gustav has that this should go beyond that. In order to bring a new material to the market to see from the user's perspective, we need to ensure that it's sustainable. And we are not looking beyond the environmental sustainability because we also have to ensure that the product is sustainable in supply, that the material is available, can be reproduced, is available over many, many years to the market. And we have, of, of course, also to build on building blocks which are sustainable not only again from an environmental perspective but it's also materials that we can rely on will be with us in the future uh, and therefore we are focusing very much on the polyolefin materials. Polyolefin materials is a family of materials uh, with polyethylene and polypropylene being the biggest ones and they consist of the world's 65 percent of the world's total consumption of plastics. So it is some huge building blocks that we can build from that is uh, widely available and recognized as, as good materials. As we say, as I mentioned, we will customize these to specific needs because the standard resins cannot do the job. We of course also make sure that products are produced in a certain way under very strict and rigid uh, quality controls uh, and ensuring that the quality is always will be at the very high level and people can rely on the quality. In regard to traceability, for instance, we uh, have 13 years of traceability, a very extensive change control program, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and again, as I said, there is no critical mass, so we can make these products available. It would not matter if automotive applications will buy into it or not, we can still make this specially available to healthcare. We have produced and participated in this market for many years. Uh, and that's, I guess, also why we were invited to participate in this program. Uh, as a material supplier, we have participated in supplying applications since the mid 90s already that has been commercially used in the hospitals uh, in IV bags, uh, dialysis bags, nutrition bags, infusion sets, catheters, for instance, urine catheters in various types of drainage applications and also now in drug packaging and delivery devices. 
So it, we have a long merit and the history of these type of materials have a long acceptance and not, uh, recognition in the market of pharmaceutical and, and medical devices. Here I'm showing a couple of examples of products. Uh, we are supplying typically, in, as I mentioned, to IV bags or different types of uh, uh, um, fluid packaging, flexible packaging. Uh, these are typically multi-layer structures, both on the film side, but also on the tubing side. We also have connector materials. So basically, we can supply as a one-stop shop the total solution, the total packaging of the material that materials that needs to go into these structures to make a successful IV bag. We are also making materials that is connecting the IV bags to the patients being tubing materials. Uh, the market has started to increase, uh, uh, shown an increased interest in also replacing the soft PVC for, for the drug delivery systems like infusion sets, catheters, and other types of, of tubings used in hospitals. We also have materials for, for stoppers, connectors, strip chambers, and so forth. Uh, again, you need to have all types of materials so you can make a total solution that is PVC free. And finally, we have the customized materials will have enhanced properties, for instance, for drug delivery, drug packaging, uh, for, for, for instance, enhanced materials for, for making high quality insulin pens or uh, taxol uh, drug packaging, et cetera. So, so we have a long history of, of, of supplying this market uh, in, in general. Uh, we produce that under our Meliflex brand. It's our XP products, and they come with merits. Very often we are talking about our materials as non-PVC products, uh, but they are more than a non-product. They actually have benefits, and those are the ones I'm trying to communicate to you now. First of all, they are not based on new materials as such. Polyethylene, polypropylene has been produced and used in the market since the 30s and the 50s. And the synthetic rubber materials, that's also part of our formulations, have been in the market since the 50s. So it is not a new chemistry as such. Uh, you can also see in the graph here that polyethylene, polypropylene, and other materials, they are more than 50% of, of the consumption in the healthcare sector. Uh, PVC is still a large part uh, due to a lot of the disposables uh, uh, tubings, etc., blood bags included. Uh, so, so we hope, of course, that number to grow. This is a, a graph with some numbers from 2007. The benefit of, of, of the polyolefin-based systems is that they are very easy to extrude. They run at very high yields and high speeds. This is also why it's been embraced in packaging, generic packaging industries and automotive applications, et cetera. So they are very cost competitive in manufacturing. They're also less temperature sensitive. That means that you can use them in a, over a wider temperature span. Again, this is something that's important when you look at a blood bag, which needs to be steam sterilized at 121 the temperature, or but at the same time also be able to, to be defreezed at, at cold temperatures. So you need to have a wide span of, 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 uh, of properties for the product that remain. Products, because of the use and, and recognition in other industries, it's much because it's very easy to recycle. I'm aware that most medical device and products are incinerated because of blood contact in the hospitals, but still this is the merit of the product that it's very easy for, for recycling. And materials that are very easy to recycle, it is because it's based from very robust chemistry. We do not use any plasticizers producing these products. It is a pure polymer matrix that we build, so there are no leaching plasticizers in these products. When they are incinerated, you will get the carbon dioxide and water as the only residuals. They have low density, and as I mentioned, very good availability and low prices. Hence, they are the perfect, perfect building blocks to create an alternative for flexible PVC and also for, for IV blood bags. If we think from an environmental perspective, 
on the products. We are, of course, in compliance with the REACH, and it does not contain any substance of very high concern. So this is, of course, an assurance that there is a, a, a perspective in using these products and, and no issues on this matter. Obviously, we did mention that there are no other monomers in here that can give you any issues when you, for instance, incinerate the products. And th another thing that's very important and a very strong benefit when you lo look at the overall per perspective and economics of the product is its low density. It is about 25 to 30 percent lower in density, being 0 0.9 for our products versus 1.25 typically for a soft PVC grade which will lead to lower material consumption. It means you have higher mileage, you can produce more products for the same kilos or use less kilos to produce the same amount of products. That also addresses Gustav's uh, concern on waste, because obviously uh, as the waste, the products have a lower weight, well then you will also have less of, of waste in the hospitals measured in kilos or tons. Another thing that is tricky with flexible PVC but uh, is when it's incinerated, it actually there's a lot of residuals in, from the waste incinerators when you are burning PVC in a safe way, whereas you don't, will, will not find it on, on these type of materials. There has been done several uh, uh, studies also in regard to the environmental profile of the products. We have participated ourselves in this. And this has shown and also been published uh, in, in, for instance, Journal of Cleaner Products, showing that it has some benefits over PVC and TPU, uh, which is another soft product used in hospitals. So it's not only something that we claim, it is something that has been proven. And parts of the, the strong merit is because of this lower density and lower consumption of material. Actually, there was also Nordic Eco labeling some years ago, did some suggestion for some swan labeling, and then they get in and characterize the different products. Uh, and there we see again the type of products that we produce, they are, are at a high good level compared to the soft PVC, which is a little bit lower end, and of course TPUs, polyurethanes, which actually is, is not a step forward. So, so products that are replacing PVC with TPU Yes, you are maybe addressing some issues in regard to to plasticizer concerns, but you, it's not a step forward in regard to the environmental profile. Lastly, uh, in regard to the health aspects of the product, uh, obviously as PVC in, in our material, they are latex and BPA free, but also they are phthalate free. Even the polypropylene is 100% phthalate free uh, produced. There are no animal residuals or, no, excuse me, uh, derivative products in it. So it's also safe in regard to BSE, TSE. And again, it does not list, it have any listed uh, substances of very high concern. Because of the chemical nature being very chemical resistant, then you also see no migration. You don't have any plasticizer migration. But at the, at the same time, you don't have any, any drug absorption either. So these products actually work very well with emulsions and fatty solutions, and that's why uh, our product has worked very well in, in replacing glass in regard to uh, nutrition bags for an application which could not be done with PVC, for instance. And of course, the uh, regulatory profile of the materials are very well established, it, and, and we do the testing at our end to ensure that it meets the ISO test, USP, pharmacopoeia, European pharmacopoeia requirements. So it was on this background that we were invited to participate in this program, and for us it was made big sense to, because we saw this as the next challenge. We felt that we had a, a good platform to build from, from our materials already used in pharmaceutical flexible primary packaging, and we thought that we, with these materials, could uh, use the, as they were or enhance them slightly to fit them in to meet the requirements of, of, PV, uh, of blood bags. We went through, of course, uh, design criteria on how to build such a, machine, uh, uh, such a bag. 
and it will it is to be produced from a multi-layer structure, meaning it's a sandwich construction of different types of materials produced by us, all very similar to each other, but they will have different functionalities going into such a multi-layer film structure and an also multi-layer tubing structure. But obviously it needs to be steam sterilized, that's very important. It needs to be having low block, uh, no blocking, no stickiness, so you have an easy filling of, of the blood into the bag has to have good softness, toughness, and strong seals so it can be handled in the hospitals in the in the way that it rolled up, put into the cups. You need to uh, you need to withstand the, the centrifuge forces, which is of course a very critical aspect. It has to have good drop resistance so it doesn't break in handling, uh, even if the bag is dropped when it's cold. You need to, as as I mentioned, uh, be freezed, defreezed. You need to have good clarity and a regulatory compliance. So based on this, we were able to find some and identify some materials with the partners in this project where we have uh, worked with some of our existing customers that are already supplying solutions to, for instance, IV bags. Uh, and with them, we have worked out uh, a multi-layer structure and, and they were able to produce films, tubings, then later that could be converted into the first prototype uh, uh, blood bags. And as I mentioned, end of last year we manufactured, uh, beginning of this year we manufactured the first prototypes. Uh, they were tested of course internally before they were released for testing at the, at the hospital, at Karolinska Sjöthuse. And the first test with some placebo testing, meaning we didn't fill it with water, or we didn't fill it with blood, but we felt it, filled it with water. We did the first dry runs, uh, and and we got much better results than we first anticipated for these first very first uh, prototype bags, uh, which is very good and promising for us to move forward on on, on it in the next step. But uh, it did sterilize. It did not block. Did not have any stickiness, even though that the film was produced without any any texture on it, which is common for PVC. We believe that if once the investment has been made by the film companies on this side, then the blocking would be even better. But it was at a very acceptable level. The tubing or, or the tubing and, and, and the film was very soft. Uh, the tubing could have been a slightly softer or some of the feedbacks because it's coiled into a, a package, very tight package into the cups and therefore next generation of bags will have a slightly softer tubes. We did not see any failures of the materials in regard to its toughness, in regard to the seals. It also, during normal handling, did not break anyway. The clarity was very, very nice, uh, very good transparency, and the kink resistance was also acceptable, uh, and the softer tube will provide even more kink resistance, so the tube doesn't break or, or collapses in the handling. It freezed, deep freezed well, and uh, and uh, and we only saw some marks on the, from the centrifuge and the freezing uh, from some clamps that was not standard blood bag clamps but some generic clamps and they gave some some offsets on on some marks but this was really because of of, uh, of the clamps design so this is something that's overcome for the next trial and we have also done the first regulatory assessments on these materials that were selected for this testing and they all complied with the testing, uh, the regulatory requirements for it. And now, of course, the next step is to do the, the blood testing, which is pending. So thank you. That was the introduction for the materials which are building the basis for, for, for the PVC-free blood bag. Uh, I hope that it gives you some comfort in the technology behind. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks, Jesper, for such an interesting and exhaustive presentation. Um, we have a question that has come through from Ole Grondal Hansen. How can the multilayer applications be recycled? Because, uh, can you hear me? Uh, because the, all the materials are based built from same type of generic polypropylene. So it's a different types of hardness and polypropylenes, but it is still all the same type of polypropylene family in the material. 
it is the same thing that we already supply to IV bags, uh, and 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 that, so it is easy recyclable. But again, it is something uh, as we have to recognize in regard to blood bags, these will be incinerated, but but the the material technology allows recycling without any issues. Thank you very much, Jesper. I would like to introduce now our last presenter for today's seminar, Lena C. She is project manager at the Yegrelius Institute for Applied Green Chemistry. Uh, Lena, you have the floor now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will continue to tell you about the challenges we found in the pre-study and how this project will overcome them. First of all, the blood bag is one of the top 10 products saving life. At the same time, there are risks involved in blood transfusion. And we need to store blood, maintaining the high quality of the red blood cells. And besides fulfilling these quality requirements and blood components, there are high material requirements, and you heard already from Jesper how we will succeed. And there are, according to the market uh, analysis in, that we made in the pre-study, not an option for the global manufacturers of today to produce a PVC-free bag. PVC is working fine and is inexpensive, and a new bag would mean new investments and long lead times. Also, in the price of the product, new product, the cost for future health problem is not included. And independent on who will bring a new bag to the market afterwards, a clear demand is crucial, especially when you heard about these financial barriers and those there are technical barriers. So, how will the project achieve a privacy free bag? So, we're going to show that it is possible to produce a PVC free blood bag that meets all the same requirements that today's bag have to meet. The new, completely new supply chain making the bag starts with Melitech in Denmark, as you heard. Melitech makes the compound and sends it to Vipak in Finland and Primo in Poland. Vipak makes the film and Primo the tubings. Both Vipak and Primo send the material to Hematronic in Italy, where the bags are produced. Karolinska University Hospital will evaluate the new bag and region Jämtland Harry Dalen in Sweden is responsible for the user tests. It is also very important to increase demand for a safer blood bag together with healthcare. Without the bias, the market introduction could be very slow. Here you have the overall objectives again. We have to show that it is possible and also increase demand together with healthcare. So how far have we come? Jesper already mentioned that we have produced a set of bags, three bags, totally PVC-free bag, uh, PVC-free, and we have tested them with water. And yesterday we started the in vitro test with blood in Stockholm, so this is my arm. I'm donating blood for the in vitro tests. Hans Gullikson and Petter Höglund at Karolinska is in charge of this evaluation. And next to come are user tests with water and one more in vitro evaluation. And there will also be economic feasibility study, life cycle assessment of the new bag. And we have now prolonged the, uh, been approved for a prolongation for the project, so it will end in March 2017. So how about increased awareness and demand? That was one of the objectives that we wanted to increase demand. 
As I said before, clear demand will facilitate market introduction independent on who will bring the bags to the market later on. And therefore, we need people in healthcare to show the support by signing a petition. This petition is not an obligation nor a commitment. It simply shows that they support a safer blood bag that fulfill existing performance and safety requirements. So my question is, if a PVC-free blood bag was available, would you buy it? A bag that would minimize patient exposure to harmful substances and a bag that would give better working environment for both manufacturers and hospital employees and also reduce long costs among all other products in healthcare due to a healthier population. You will find the petition on our website. You just have to click on the go in. So that was all for me. Thank you, Lena. Um, thank you very much. Um, I have a question. How can you issue a PVC free blood bag? I, I could hear you, Grazia. Could you repeat the question? Yeah. How can you be sure that the PVC free blood bag is safe? Uh, first, yes, first of all, as Jesper told us, uh, starting with a really good uh, material specific specification, we had a, a requirement specification in the pre-study what we uh, wanted from the bag, uh, good material without um, um, harmful substances, and these have been transformed to the material specification of the compound, and also we will, of course, uh, control that this is true, that there are no none of these substances in the material as well. Thank you very much, Lena. Uh, I now have a question for Gusta. Um, the question has come from Gusta, staying green though here, sorry about my pronunciation. Um, is the quality of PVC free blood bags equal to the PVC bag? If not, how do you motivate your staff? Okay. Uh, well, we, of course the blood bag must fulfill the, the standards for blood bags. So if it doesn't, we just have to try it and we need to get a, if it, uh, if it is a difference in some areas of the, of the uh, handling of the bag, we just need to try it and we need to accept that every issue of the bag can be handled, every single, uh, 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 every single uh, handling. But, and we don't, but it must fulfill the, the, the uh, all the uh, uh, expectations on a blood bag that, that uh, will that so that it will be safe for the patient. That's the main thing. Thank you very much, Gustav. We come now to the end of the webinar. We have heard that it is both possible and feasible to produce and use PVC-free blood bags. As the speakers have mentioned, the European legislation is not strong enough to increase demand for safer blood bags and to create incentives for industry to produce them. Currently, a new medical device regulation proposal is being debated at the European level, uh, and Healthcare Without Harm Europe has been advocating for a phase out of hazardous substances contained in medical devices like talents, if safer alternatives are available. We hope that this requirement will be incorporated in the final legal text so that PVC-free blood bags as well as other PVC-free or phthalate-free medical devices will find a wide use in healthcare facilities in Europe. Our thanks go to Gustav Eriksson, Jesper Lawarsen, and Lena Stee for their interesting presentations and fantastic work. Thank you so much. Thanks also to all participants for their time and interest. Should you have any questions that we were not able to address during this webinar, please direct them to the project's communication officer, Katarina, 
Wittenberg, who will forward them to the relevant, relevant panelists after we finish here. Please email Katarina uh, at yegrelius.se. For more information about Helka Without Harm, please visit our website, nonharmeurope.org, uh, uh, where you can also sign up for our newsletters. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at HCWH Europe. Goodbye and have a nice afternoon.